The general lady yields. Uh, I now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Luttrell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chief Ortiz, thank you for your service. Mr. Kagan, you, you as well. Uh, Chief, are you a direct report to the Secretary of Mayorka? There is a, a commissioner and a deputy commissioner in between the secretary and myself. Do you communicate with them often? I communicate often with the secretary several times a week, sir. So I want to piggyback off of what Ms. Green said, because we were just read in on this, this explosive device that was discovered by one of your Border Patrol agents. Now, obviously, sir, you, you're aware of this. How is it that you are not? Because as the, as the investigative arm of the department, we're focused on investigating TCOs. And the intelligence shared between our two agencies is robust. It happens all the time. The, we're, we're not actively, it, it's, so it's not my- So here, here's my issue when me, it's, me, when, well, no, no. It, this is one of the issues I see between the, and I respect everything that both of you do and everybody that works for you, but the breakdown of communication and the silos that we work in is what's detrimental to this country right now. And if there is an explosive device, if the cartels are using explosive device against our agents, that changes the narrative. So can I, can I answer my job as the assistant director over Please. transnational organized crime is not domestic operations. Our domestic operations folks that work in the field day in and day out are the ones that communicate with the Border Patrol. I'm saying me personally, I do not know. I, have, I can get back to you and let you know whether HSI as a whole knows and our domestic operations knows. So I just wanted to clarify that. Point. Thank you. So I would assume that the two individuals that you report to, sir, have reported to Secretary Mayorkas about this explosive device, which tells me that Mayorkas has reported this to the president and nothing has been said or done to the American public, and Congress was, had no idea this was going on. Mm -hmm. Now, if this is the case, and we're surging money, billions, hundreds of billions of dollars across the seas to secure everybody else, and we're not doing anything here in my state, in our southern border, that's a problem, because that means that they're lying to us. Response? I will tell you that if there's a significant event along the southwest border, whether it's a significant seizure or an arrest, we... I'm will, not talking about drugs anymore. I'm talking about explosives. I, I, any significant event, whether it be a terrorist, whether it be a significant narcotics load, uh, criminal alien, high-value target, we will coordinate with our investigative partners, and they vary in numbers, whether it's FBI, whether it's the DEA, or our HSI partners. We all belong to Joint Terrorism Task Force. If it's associated with terrorism, every single one of us has an agent or a task force member. And so that information is shared amongst that group. Uh, it hasn't been shared with us, okay? And so here's my problem. If you share something of this nature with us, we can help, okay? Another question, Chief. You said consequences, and you said that your agents don't feel like they have legislation or that legislation is not enforced to support them in their duties. Who specifically is telling you not to do that? What memo and whose name is on the bottom of that so we can go after them? So when I say consequences, I'm talking about two things. I'm talking about prosecutions, and I'm talking about repatriations back to their home country. We have to have those tools in our toolkit to be able to deal with the migrant surges that we're seeing right now. With respect to legislative changes or policy changes, that's out of my wheelhouse, Congressman. That, that is your responsibility. That's the administration's responsibility. My responsibility is to enforce the laws on the books and do everything I can to make sure our men and women have the tools that they need out there to do the job. Okay, so tell me right now which ones you need that are in place, that they're not being enforced so we can so we can do something about that. And if you don't have that in front of you right now, please get it to me. I will, or sir. Us. Could, could I interrupt as the chairman just a second? I want to make sure I understand yes, Mr. Luttrell's questions. You're asking which policies need to be reinstated in order for him to do his job? Is yes, that, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. I'm sorry if that didn't come out clearly. I apologize. Yeah, that's okay. Go ahead, uh, Chief. Once again, whatever consequences, uh, you can call it migrant protection protocols, you can call it remain in Mexico, you can call it a safe third country. All of the tools that the Border Patrol and DHS have at their disposal are going to allow us to do a better job of managing this border. I yield back, sir. 
Uh, we'll uh, come to order without objection. The committee may recess at any point. I'd like to go ahead and uh, welcome everyone back to the full committee. And I recognize myself for an opening statement. Good morning, Secretary Mayorkas. Thanks for joining the committee. We look forward to hearing from you as we discuss the department's budget and the crisis this administration has created at our southwest border. This year, we recognize the department's 20th anniversary and thank the many public servants, past and present, who have worked tirelessly to keep our homeland safe. In the aftermath of 9-11, the department was created to safeguard the American people. This mission includes securing the U.S. borders and approaches. Mr. Secretary, you took an oath where you swore to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office. Your job is to protect the homeland. And one of those obvious duties is to secure the United States sovereign borders and to implement the laws duly passed by Congress. However, you have not secured our borders, Mr. Secretary, and I believe you've done so intentionally. There is no other explanation for the systematic dismantling and transformation of our border into a lawless and dangerous open border. You've asserted in the past that it's an issue of resources, but the numbers show a very different story. In just the two years of your tenure, more people have crossed our southern border into the United States than the previous 12 years of two administrations combined. Did the budget suddenly decrease and result in this massive surge? No. Did the number of Border Patrol agents suddenly get cut in January of 2021? No. What got cut were 89 effective policies. As Chief Ortiz told us in our hearing in McAllen, Texas, we don't have a resource crisis, we have a policy crisis. We will fulfill our obligation to the American people and our oath to the Constitution. Secretary Mayorkas, need I remind you that Congress makes the laws and the executive branch is obligated to follow those laws? Apparently, the answer to that question is yes, because since you've become secretary, you've disregarded the laws written by this branch of government, laws passed by both Republicans and Democrats. Behind me, you can see a list of the ways you've made our border and our country less secure. You intentionally ended all construction of and contracts to build the border wall system. You attempted to terminate the migrant protection protocols remain in Mexico policy, and when these efforts failed you, refused to fully enforce the policy. You illegally and without congressional approval created mass parole programs for countries like Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Venezuela, and expanded the use of the CBP-1 app to facilitate these programs. This is ultimately playing a shell game, Mr. Secretary, wherein those who would otherwise come illegally with no justification for entry now get to enter under the pretense of legality. You lowered the credible fear standards so even illegal border crossers who've broken the laws of the United States can claim asylum despite knowing that nine out of 10 claims will be found illegitimate. You instructed ICE agents not to detain or deport the vast majority of individuals illegally in the country, while also stating that the crime of being in the country illegally is by itself no longer grounds for removal. You just made that up. You refused to detain illegal aliens pursuant to the Immigration and Nationality Act and instead allowed them to be processed in mass into the United States. You moved northern border agents to the southwestern border, leaving our northern border vulnerable which has led to an increase in encounters in some sectors as much as 900%. And finally, you ended Title 42 in May without any plan to deal with the surge. What's this gotten us? Well, here behind me, you can see the results. Unfortunately, the facts are overwhelming. More than 5 million encounters at the Southwest border since President Biden took office. 1.4 million gotaways, known gotaways, who evaded U.S. Border Patrol agents since President Biden took office. And these are only the ones we know about. We learned from U.S. Border Patrol Chief Ortiz that these numbers are likely 20% higher. 80 individuals on the terrorist watch list have crossed the southwest border so far in FY23. 14,148 pounds of fentanyl seized in 23, enough to kill the entire U.S. population. The U.S. population you swore to defend 
and protect over nine and a half times. And this is only the amount we know about. We have no idea how much of this poison is actually being brought into the country by drug smugglers taking advantage of our porous border and your lax policies. Last month, this committee held a hearing in McAllen where Chief Ortiz stated under oath that DHS does not have the operational control of our borders, contradicting testimony that you previously gave before this committee. Chief Ortiz went on to say that five of our nine sectors of our southwest border are under the control of the drug cartels. Unimaginable. Secretary Mayorkas, your reckless border policies are enriching the drug cartels, and these cartels are laughing in our face. They find it amusing that the most powerful nation on earth is not only unwilling to stop them, but is actively facilitating their business model. Unfortunately, your admission during the March 28-23 Senate Judiciary hearing that you're unaware that cartels are using illegal aliens as decoys to detract Border Patrol agents while they smuggle illicit contraband and illegal aliens across the border only emboldens these cartels. Honestly, your admission reflects incompetence. Imagine a general officer in the Army who has no clue about the strategy of his enemy. We'd fire that general on the spot. Mr. Secretary, every time you fail to acknowledge that this is a crisis, you lose even more credibility with the men and women of DHS, to say nothing of the American people. As you ignore the crisis at our border, thousands of Border Patrol agents and CBP officers are on the front lines, putting their lives at risk to keep our country safe. And what kind of treatment do they receive from you? They're accused of whipping migrants crossing the border. And now we find out that your department knew the whole time that this report was bogus. You went on national television and vilified these agents of the Horse Patrol unit. These men and women are proud to fulfill their duty to secure our border, and they do this with no thanks, no support, and quite honestly, dishonesty from this administration. It's downright shameful. I don't blame our Border Patrol agents for feeling the way they do about you. As, former, as a former Army officer and doctor and CEO, I know that when a leader loses the trust of those he's entrusted to command and serve, it's over. Now, Let's turn our attention to your budget proposal for DHS. Mr. Secretary, this budget proposal is an insult to every American. It fails to take seriously many of the most pressing national security threats, especially our wide open border. President Biden himself likes to quote, and, and I quote him, don't tell me what you value, show me your budget and I'll tell you what you value, end quote. Well, this budget clearly shows us what this administration values and it's not the safety of the American people. Like your past budgets, like your policy decisions, and your actions, this proposed DHS budget has the singular purpose of continuing to encourage people to come into this country illegally. Here behind me, you can see uh, this very clearly. Pet projects at the DHS, we're going to add $4 billion. But for CBP, we're going to cut their budget by $1.2 billion. U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, the folks that move people into the United States, we're going to give them another one point billion. That's what you want to do. ICE, you're going to decrease by $421 million. This is all about moving people into the country and not about border security. The objective of this budget is not to secure our border, but to force CBP personnel to process illegal aliens into the interior of the United States. The proposed $4.7 billion Southwest Border Contingency Fund is just another gimmick to spend American taxpayer dollars on a crisis you created with a goal of processing illegal aliens quicker out of DHS custody so that you can settle them into the interior of our country. The administration's saying the quiet part out loud. By requesting funding for border management instead of border security, you're signaling you have no intention of securing our borders. Instead of spending money spending any money on wall construction that would actually have both a practical and deterrent impact, the administration has proposed spending $3.9 billion, $3 billion of DHS money on a climate resilience program. Meanwhile, you propose spending a mere $40 million to combat fentanyl that's devastating our country. 
Do you think the parents and families who will continue to lose their children, their brothers, their sisters to fentanyl will take comfort in knowing that DHS has at least added more to the massive money already spent by this administration on climate change? I don't think so. Mr. Secretary, I could go on and on, but I will yield. I do hope you've come here today ready to be honest with the American people because if you're bold enough to make these policy decisions, you should be brave enough to own up to them and their consequences. Mr. Higgins from Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, you stand in your testimony today regarding operational control of our southern border, which by any reasonable man's definition has certainly been lost. You stand it on a word in the, in the legislation that gave birth to the specific law saying all illegal crossing and no one's ever. We'll take a drip. America be okay with that. Would you and your execution of your inaugurated president's policy have given America a flood? We've identified over 11 laws that you violated. Some of the most egregious, the Secure Fence Act, 2006, concerning operational control. Immigration Nationalization Act 236, Section C8, U.S. Code 1226, concerning detention. INA 241, Section A2, U.S. Code 81231, concerning detention. Immigration and Nationalization Act, Section D5, Alpha. 8 U.S. Code 1182 concerning parole. We've given you ample opportunity to, to, to seek some sort of honorable exit from your executive position, sir. We take no pleasure in witnessing you dismantle yourself as a fellow American before the whole country. Your legacy, millions of illegals enter our country, millions under your watch, loss of operational control of our border, aligning DHS policy as an asset, the Mexican cartel drug and human trafficking, the disintegration of our national sovereignty, destruction of countless thousands of Texas family lives, overwhelming crime waves sweeping across our country, over a million criminal runners you call gotaways flooding into America, many carrying backpacks loaded with deadly fentanyl and meth, or herding teenage girls into prostitution, sex slave networks across America. 225,000 Americans dead from Mexican cartel drug overdose since you took office. Two years ago, you and your inaugurated president, but mostly you, sir, because you have your whole mind about you, and you have a highly decorated background in border operations, so you're supposed to be the expert. You, sir, are the Secretary of Homeland Security who has failed in your sworn oath to protect our nation from invasion. You had an obligation to execute the president's policies or advise the president if his policies were bringing injury to America. Ultimately, your oath requires you to secure our nation's sovereign border with Mexico and do anything necessary to stop the Mexican cartels from trafficking endless wave upon human wave of illegals into America, along with miserable death, unspeakable grief, Graveyards filled from sea to shining sea with the bodies of American sons and daughters, dead from fentanyl. You've brought generational trauma upon our country. I believe history will witness your era of service as a transitional time in our country. Well, what was America like before Secretary Mayorkas, and what was America like after him? It's stunning that you could sit there and, and smugly grin 
as if you've not miserably failed your country. We could give you money to, to hire a thousand new border agents. Nobody wants to work for you. They're coming forth. We can't keep up with the whistleblowers that are coming to testify against your command. We could give you money to deploy all sorts of new technology. I have evidence in my file that you've given command to not deploy technology that you currently have because it interfered with the cartel's business model. We're done, done, done with your lies to America. It's shameful what you brought upon our country. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I have no interest in asking the Secretary any questions. Mr. He Chairman. obfuscates and lies. Mr. Chairman. I yield. Mr. Chairman. I now recognize myself for five minutes of questioning. I want to show a video, but first need to set the stage. Earlier in the year, we had a hearing at the border with Border Patrol Chief Ortiz, and I asked him if by the definition written into the law, we have operational control of our southwest border. He said resoundingly, we do not. Following that, Mr. Secretary, you were questioned before the Senate about operational control. Uh, this was uh, March the 28th, just a few days ago. Let's watch your testimony. With respect to the definition of operational control, I do not use the definition that appears in the Secure Fence Act. And the Secure Fence Act provides statutorily that operational control is defined as preventing all unlawful entries into the United well, States. By that definition, no administration has ever had operational control. So here you admit that according to the definition that's in the code, no secretary has ever had operational control. So you know that that definition written into the law has not been achieved. Now, let's go back a few months to the testimony you gave here in the House. This is before Chief Ortiz admitted and told the truth that there was no security at the southwest border. Next clip. Will you testify under oath right now? Do we have operational control, yes or no? Yes, we do. And we have we operational are, control of the borders. Yes, we do. And, Congressman, and we are working to... So what operational control defined? In this section, the term operational control means the prevention of all unlawful entries into the United States, including entries by terrorists, other unlawful aliens, instruments of terrorism, narcotics, and other contraband. Do you stand by in your testimony that we have operational control in light of this definition? And Congressman, I think the um, Secretary of Homeland Security would have said the same thing in 2020. Mr. Roy in reads... 2019. Mr. Roy reads the very definition you just admitted last month in the Senate that has not been achieved. He said, according to this definition, do you have operational control? According to the definition that you just said, no one has operation, have ever had operational control. He asks you, under oath, in the United States Congress, if you had operational co control according to that definition, and you said, I do. That is a false statement because you admitted in the Senate that no one has ever achieved that. You make it very clear, Mr. Secretary, that you've known all along, according to the definition that is written in the law, passed by the Congress, that you do not have operational control. And yet, in testimony to this House, under oath, the definition was read to you. You've asked, according to that, you're asked according to that definition, whether control exists, and you say yes. That sounds like a lie under oath. Now, I want to, I want to change the subject just a bit. I want to set the stage for another clip. Senator Cornyn, just last month, is asking you about uh, the cartel strategy. And he describes what Border Patrol officers and leaders have come before this committee, Congress, told us on trips to the border, is the strategy of the drug cartels. They've been telling us this for 18 months. The cartels are overwhelming the crossing sites, tying up the Border Patrol. And then they're slipping the drugs and the human trafficking and the nefarious folks they want to get in the U.S. around the CBP when they're tied up. It's a, it's a distraction. In the military, we'd call it a neutralizing attack. He even says that Merrick Garland, the attorney general of this administration, came before their committee and said, yes, this is the cartel strategy. 
Let's see clip number three. Are you familiar with that strategy? Do you agree with the Attorney General? I, I am not aware of uh, that as a strategy. So the cartel's main strategy is something you're not even aware of. I, I guess there's no communications between you and the Attorney General. Inside this administration, do you, you guys don't talk to one another? Um, that's insane, Mr. Secretary. You just admitted you have no clue about the central strategy of the cartels you've created by your open border. What, again, what general officer would we allow to stay on the job in the Army if he didn't understand the strategy of the enemy? Not only have you lied under oath, you just admitted your own incompetence. It's, it's really quite unacceptable. You knew very well the definition wasn't being fulfilled. You told Chip Roy, Congressman Roy, yes, I have operational control by that definition. And then later, under oath, you admit, no one's ever had control by that definition. Then you tell the Senate, I don't even know what the cartel's main strategy is. I'm out of time, Mr. Secretary. But that doesn't paint a very good picture of someone who's doing their job very well. I now yield to the rank. Lady from uh, Georgia is recognized, and we will give her, her time, the time when the clock was stopped, and we'll give you an extra 10 or 15 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Mayorkas, since you have been in charge of the Department of Homeland Security, there have been zero miles of border wall added there have been over 5.5 million illegal alien encounters at our border, 1.3 million known gotaways, and approximately 870% increase in apprehensions in just one sector of the northern border. American mothers and infants suffered a severe baby formula shortage all while this administration was happily stocking the shelves for illegal aliens at one of one of the largest processing centers in the country. American mothers were forced to delay inductions at the Yuma Regional Medical Center because of your policies. They have flooded their maternity unit with illegal aliens. Tens of thousands of migrant children have been forced into slave labor in our country because of your policies. At least 853 dead migrants and counting, the most ever in a 12-month period, died trying to cross the southern border in 2022. And now there are over 300 Americans a day dying every single day, every single day, without, without fail, every single day because of fentanyl, deadly fentanyl, which is the number one cause of death in young people between ages 18 and 45. Now we have rain, rainbow fentanyl, which even NBC News was acknowledging that the cartels were bringing across our border, and it comes from China. This rainbow fentanyl looks like sweet tarts or Skittles, clearly made to target America's school children. It's 50 times more potent than heroin, 100 times more potent than morphine. And now under your tenure, Secretary Mayorkas, schools all over America have to have Narcan to save children that overdose on this deadly poison. Let me explain something to you. I'm not from Texas. I'm not from any border state. I represent a district in Georgia, which is in Northwest Georgia. We're not anywhere near Mexico. We're not anywhere near the ocean. But in my district, in my district, people die nearly every single day from fentanyl. And I want to know from you, how many more people do we have to watch die every single day in America? How many more young people do we have to see die? How many more teenagers? How many more parents cry themselves to sleep at night if they can even sleep because their child overdosed on fentanyl? How long are you going to continue this outrage, complete outrage, where China is poisoning America's children, poisoning our teenagers, poisoning our young people? How long are you going to let this go on? 
Congresswoman, let me assure you that we're not letting it go on. We are fighting this. No, I reclaim my time. You're a liar. You are letting this go on, and the numbers prove it. You can't lie about the facts, Secretary, Secretary Mayorkas. While you live in denial and sit over there with this attitude that you're doing everything Let's right, you down. are killing Americans with your policies. And that is a fact. Your policies are killing people, over 300 yeah. Americans a day, over 300, and it's outrageous. Let me ask you another question. Let's we down. talk about Let's terror. Uh, the, the ranking members recognized. You know, we can disagree, but just the fact that we have people watching, uh, you don't have to call uh, a witness a liar. Mm -hmm. And, and I just... Excuse me, does the ranking member have a point of order? Well, no, obviously. actually, I want you to take the words uh, of the speaker down. So, so uh, I, I mean, but I need to explain. Why. So the gentleman does have a, is yes. raising a point, yes. point of order. So the point is, uh, in raising this point of order. And John Lay's time will be restored. You know, we have a history of being a bipartisan committee that work on solutions. Now, we can disagree, but we've gotten to the point of the language that we're using uh, is not the kind of language that historically we, as members of this committee, uh, we've used. And again, I just think in the interest of civility of this committee, uh, I would implore all of the members that I understand the strength and concern but, you know, uh, there's a way that we ought to conduct ourselves. And what I'm hearing uh, is not how a majority of this committee conducts business, and we can do better. So I ask that the words be taken down. The committee will suspend. The gentleman will state the words that he wishes to be taken down. The general lady uh, referenced the secretary and called him a liar. Uh, Chair asks the uh, gentlelady if um, she wishes to seek unanimous consent to modify or withdraw her remarks. I will not withdraw my remarks because the facts show the proof. Okay. Um, So in uh, making a ruling on this, uh, it's pretty clear that the rules state you can't impugn someone's uh, character. Uh, identifying or calling someone a liar is unacceptable in this committee. And I make the ruling that we strike those words. It's, uh, sorry, just a point of order, it's a legitimate question. You're recognized. Our, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Did you move to take the words down or to strike them, Mr. Thompson? Yeah, sorry, I just stepped in. Point yeah, of uh, take them down. That's, so that's what we do. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah. Uh, my understanding is, if words are taken down, that means that the the member can no longer speak in whatever the proceeding is that those words were said. I, personal inquiry. Point of personal inquiry. That's there's no, no such Stand thing. Stand by just a second. So in consulting the rules of the House, uh, when we strike, uh, it does terminate the time of the individual who is speaking. So uh, the gentlelady is no longer recognized. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Ivey, I believe. Uh, can I make a point of inquiry, you, Mr. Chairman? You can. So the, the ruling was that because she used the word liar, um, that was taken down, which I agree with. Yes. But, but accusing... A this statement of fact is very similar to the posters that uh, Mr. There's uh, no statement of fact. There's no statement of fact. There's no, there's there's no, no factual fact. basis for the statement. We're not here to debate this, okay? And the ruling was made by the chair that these 
previous words were not against the rules of Clause 1 and Clause 4 of Rule 17. But to tell someone that they are a liar is... It, it's pretty clear in the rules. Slander is clearly covered by the rules. The, the, the impugnment, I can't imagine an allegation worse than the one that she just made. I mean, that has got to be so, in the category of taking the, taking the words down. No, no, it, it, it is not, it does not fit the rules by the ruling of the chair. And we've already voted on that. It has passed us. We have the secretary until about 1.30. We're going to move on. And Mr. Ivey, you're recognized for your, your five minutes of questioning. Uh, the gentleman from Texas is now recognized. Texas, Arizona, <laughs> oh, Mr. Arizona. Chair. My apologies, Come on. Mr. Crane. I I will do push-ups for you. <laughs> Push them out, sir. We'll give you seven seconds back. All right. Thank you, Secretary Mayorkas, for appearing uh, before our committee. I know it's been a tough day for you, um, and I think that's for good reason. I want to uh, start my comments. Um, with looking at the causation of this crisis at our southern border. You know, it wasn't more than a couple years ago um, during the Democratic primary that your boss, now President Biden, said during a debate, we're a nation that says, you want to flee, you're fleeing oppression, you should come. Everybody with a brain saw this coming, sir. We all saw this coming. We saw this president during his race, roll out the red carpet. We knew what it was going to cause. We, everybody shouted it from the rooftops, and now it's here. And you all want to act like it's, some, it, it's something else. You all want to act like you didn't invite this, and you most certainly did. Sir, you said in your opening statements that um, you're attacking cartels and sm smugglers in an unequivocal, unequivocal way. You most certainly are not, sir. As a matter of fact, if they were in this room right now, the heads of these cartels, you know what they'd tell us? They'd say, hey, reelect these guys again. And by, by all means, keep that guy right in his seat because he's our MVP. He's making it so easy for us to smuggle drugs, smuggle people, get gangs into this country, distract our Border Patrol agents, and at the same time, destroy the U.S. economy. So you're, do, you're not doing a good job, sir, and that is why right here, you see that, sir? You see that one on, on your left? That resolution? Those are articles of impeachment that Andy Biggs, Congressman Andy Biggs, and several of us supported. Now, I've never met you before in my life. You and I have no personal beef. No, there's no animosity as far personally. The reason that I agreed to sign on to these articles of impeachment with my colleague and others is because of the dereliction of duty. You know, I've got graphs up here too. You can see these graphs showing what, what it was like at the border before you got into office and what it's like now. Here's the sad thing, sir. These aren't just graphs. They're not just numbers that have been thrown at you today. They're American families. And I'm so glad that my colleague made you or asked you to get up, turn around and face one of them. I'm glad that you had to look at something that wasn't just a data point or a graph, but you actually had to look at a family because there's tens of thousands of them. Tens of thousands. 70,000 because of fentanyl alone. That doesn't count all the families that have been destroyed by gangsters that have come come up through South America, or the families that have been destroyed because of sex trafficking, I'm glad you had to face them. You know what, sir? I actually had to face one of them in my district last week. I had to face one of them in my district last week, and it was hard. This woman was choking back tears, asking me, Congressman Crane, what are you going to do? My daughter was killed. My beautiful daughter was killed because of fentanyl. And I said, you know what? We've drafted articles of impeachment to remove Secretary Mayorkas for his dereliction of duty. You know, it's interesting, sir, because Mr. Higgins, one of my colleagues up here, noticed your smugness. I noticed it too. And you know, for some, somebody that has a history of working in border security like yourself, and knowing, it, and, and my colleague right here, Mr. Breachin, 
He just pointed out that you work for administrations where they were actually building walls. But you know what? Me and this gentleman right here went on a helicopter tour down in Texas where we flew around the border, and guess what we saw? Piles of steel just stacked up on the ground, like he said, of a wall that we've all, the American taxpayers have already paid for, and because of your dereliction of duty, and because of this president and this administration, we continue to have drugs, gang members, sex trafficking pouring into this country, and you sit there with a smug look on your face. But I noticed for a second, because I was watching your face, I was watching your face when the family behind you stood up. Mr. Fluger asked you if you would address them. I noticed that just for a second, the smugness left your face, sir. And I'm glad that you had to feel uncomfortable today. And that's not because I don't have any humanity at all. I look at your story. I look that you immigrated here from Cuba. And you know what? I think that's great. I really do, sir. And you might not, you might not think that in this exchange right here. I think that it's a great thing that America has so many amazing immigrants here. And this side of the aisle, we're not hung up about immigration. We're not hung up about legal immigration. What we're hung up about is how you all, day one in office, came in and changed policies and started getting rid of infrastructure that was keeping our states, our counties, and our cities safe. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady yields. I now recognize uh, Mr. Luttrell from Texas. Good afternoon, Mr. Secretary. How are you today? Good afternoon, Congressman. Um, you know, I had a lot of a line of questioning I was going to ask you, and I got to tell you, just um, you know, to mimic Ms. Clark's statements, I think this committee needs to do a better job. If we spend as much time solving problems instead of wire brushing ourselves, there's a point in time I forgot you were in here. And I want to ask you face-to-face, man-to-man, will you meet with me in the next few weeks so we can hash this out? Because what I hear, what I seem to think that I'm hearing is there's a breakdown in communication and the understanding of either vernacular or language that either makes you responsible for what we have, of our expectation. And I, th I think there's a breakdown there. So will you, I'm asking you, would you meet with me so I can tell you what I'm seeing from my district in Texas? Congressman, I would gladly. Yes or no? Thank you. I would gladly meet with you. Thank you. And I got I got so I represent Texas eight. We are basically a landing zone for the border. OK, and I want to bring two names to your attention. Mr. Ethan Griffin, age 22, and Mr. Joshua Gillahan, age 14, both perished from fentanyl. OK, and I don't care what administration you're talking about now. Right. I'm past red and blue. OK. Joshua died 18, eight months ago. Okay, here, here are my numbers, sir, in my district. In 2020, 325 deaths. In 2021, 538 deaths. 2022, 600 plus, and the number is growing this year. Now, sir, you are the commander of the ship. I have to point my finger at you. I wanted you to address me and say, what would you say to the mothers of these two young men, those babies, because they're in the room? I'm not gonna politicize you, sir. But I would ask you, that you, when you go to Mr. Pfluger's office, I'm gonna have those mothers there. Would you please address that? Because here's my issue, sir. Every day, every day, I run into those mamas. Every day. And I have to tell them, I'm working on it. Every day in my district, they ask me, why isn't the border secure? What can we do to enhance border security so we are not overwhelmed? And every day, your name comes up. And I can't imagine, after seeing what I've seen today, how challenging it is to you to lead this department. We will do better. I give you my word as a Texan and as a congressman that with this committee, we will do better to provide you guidance as a united body so you can secure our border. That's what we need. Do you agree to that? Congresswoman, Congressman. Whoa. I mean, All right, hey, back that up, buddy. I identify as a man, <laughs> and I don't have any pronouns. Congressman. I apologize. Congressman, we need to work together to address the challenges that have been the subject of this hearing. And fentanyl and the scourge of fentanyl is one of them. Let me share with you that the scourge of fentanyl is not new to 2023. 
it is not. I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying that at all, sir. What I'm saying is these numbers, and again, you heard me say, I don't care what administration you're talking about, these numbers are progressively getting worse. So you and I and this committee and this body politic need to put aside our differences because it is the American public that are suffering. No wonder they're pissed at us. Yes? Agreed, Congressman. Let me share with you one thing that we could do, just one example of what we can do together. Fund the Department of Homeland Security for $305 million so we have a greater level of non-intrusive inspection technology to detect and I, I, I agree that we need to fund. However, sir, if we're going to spend, what, $3 million on a private law firm to help you prep for hearings, from what I understand, the documentation that I saw today, 1.5 million already gone out the door. As a fiscally conservative man, if we want to fund a department, let's fund it. And let's, not, let's just not go spending things that we don't need to spend taxpayer dollars on. How about that? Congressman, I, I respectfully um, must say that you are conflating very serious issues with um, other issues that do not relate. Which, to which serious issue am I conflating? Yeah. That, the border problem? Well, let me, hey, be careful because I'm kind of on your side right now, but that can switch, especially after you call me a woman. Congressman, I, I apologize. It's been a number of hours. I've been here with you the whole time. I get it. Yeah. Um, well, let, let me share with you. Your seat over these last few hours has been very, very different than my seat. So my level... So I apologize for enough. the error. In you think so? I, I meant you just no. think because you're taking darts from this committee and... Oh, didn't you just hear me say that I got to stand in front of those two mothers back there and explain to them how, what I'm doing to make sure their babies and other babies, you know, what the reason that they died? I didn't think so. I yield back. The gentleman from Louisiana yields. I now recognize Mr. Fluger from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a sad day. America's security has never been weaker than it is under the Biden administration. And your reign as Secretary of Homeland Security. On March 13th of this year, a Texas DPS trooper attempted to stop Rashian Comer for speeding. And Comer refused to stop in a reckless high-speed chase ensued. And at one point during this chase, uh, the suspect began to nonchalantly live stream himself driving at 105 miles per hour and evading the police officer behind him. At the same time, a 71-year-old year grandmother and her seven-year-old granddaughter were on their way home after a play date. Their names were Maria and Amelia Tambunga. Maria is the mother of two of my constituents. As Maria passed through the intersection of State Highway 163 and I-10 Service Road, Comer blew through a red light and struck Maria and Amelia's vehicle. They were pronounced dead at the scene along with two other people. After law enforcement secured that scene, it was revealed that Khmer was a human trafficker smuggling 11 illegal aliens in his truck, evading the law. Over the last few weeks, I have heard countless stories of this beautiful seven-year-old girl about Amelia and Maria, about how Amelia was an outgoing fashionista. She wanted to be an influencer, about how she loved to play with her friends and dance with her Aunt Jenny and cook with her grandmother, Maria. I'm wearing a pink tie today, Mr. Secretary, in honor of that little girl. Most importantly, Mr. Secretary, the Tambunga family is here today. Emilio, Maria's husband, and Emilio's grandfather, Elisa, Maria's daughter, and, and Emilio's mother, and Virginia, Maria's daughter, and Emilio's aunt, they're sitting right behind you. They came here today because they want answers. They came here today because of the failures of you and your leadership. They came here because they want closure. They deserve answers. Mr. Mayorkas, will you turn around and offer them your condolences and an apology for the failure of your administration that led to the death of their loved ones? They're right there. They're standing right there. Congressman. Mr. Secretary, they're standing there, and I think they deserve an apology from you. Congressman, Mr. Chairman, may I stand and turn my back? Cer certain, certainly. It is a failure of the policies that have allowed hundreds of thousands of families to go through this grief. They want to meet with you today. 
Mr. Secretary. I'll host it in my office. Will you commit to meeting with them? Congressman, I most certainly will, as long as you Thank do you. not politicize the meeting. Mr. Secretary, the only person tragedy. politicizing anything here is you. The security of this country is not a political matter. In fact, on September 21, 2021, you told me in this committee room that the border was secure. If we can play that video. Mr. Chairman, I think we have a video that is going to play. My time is continuing. Yeah, go ahead. If you want to ask or talk about something else while they tee that up, um, see what's going on here with our, uh, here we go. We'll give you a little extra time. So that took some time. Is the border more secure under your leadership than when you started? Uh, Congressman, the border is secure. We're executing our plan. And I've been very clear and unequivocal in that regard. Mr. Secretary, the, Secretary, the question is, is the border more secure now under your leadership? Congressman, Mr. it is no less secure than it was previously. Mr. Mayorkas, are you going to tell the Tambunga family that the border is secure today? Congressman, you are politicizing a tragedy. No, I'm not politicizing tragedy. They came here to Washington, D.C. of their own volition to get accountability for the loss of their family, two beloved members of their family. This year, we had a hearing at the border, which no Democrat came to. Not a single Democrat came to the hearing that we had in McAllen, Texas, and Chief Ortiz said that the border is not secure. Do you disagree with Chief Ortiz? Congressman, uh, let me uh, return to what you said. Accountability is brought in a court of law. Mr. Mayor, I delivered accountability for 12 years. Mr. Mayor, Chris, do you problem. disagree with the head Border Patrol agent when he said that our border is not secure? Congressman, I have testified to that issue. So you do disagree times. with him. You disagree with your chief of Border Patrol. I respectfully do in that regard, You do. Not a single Border Patrol agent that I've talked to in the past three years has said that they trust your leadership or have faith that you're keeping our country secure. I look forward to the meeting with the Tambunga family and coming up with real solutions. And I hope that all of my Democrat colleagues will meet the Tambunga family and listen to their story and understand the things that are happening in my state and in others because of the failure of these policies. And we have the answers right in front of us. I hope that every one of you will do that. You had the opportunity in McAllen, Texas, and it's time to meet with him. I yield back. The gentleman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you, you, you know what the number is, don't you? Number that Mr. Gates was trying to get an answer, get a response from. You know what that number is, right? Congressman, I would be pleased to provide this committee, you, Mr. No, no, Chairman. You, you, uh, know, you don't know now? You don't know what that is? I mean, again, just to, just to read, because what Mr. Gates was trying to get at, I think what the country would like to know is we know that there's been an influx of people coming in. Two, over 2 million encounters on our southern border, inadmissible uh, aliens on our southern border. We know that's, that number has come in since Joe Biden's been president. We know it's a big number. And all he was asking was how many of that two point something million, over two million, how many have went through the adjudication process and actually been removed? Mr. Chairman. And you're telling, you're telling the, the Judiciary Committee today you don't know what that number is? Mr. Chairman, what I am sharing with you is that we will provide you with whatever data you request. No, no, that's not where I, I want to go right, but it's a simple, we, we've had kind of two simple questions that you didn't give an answer to, and I just want to know, if, give you a, a second chance here if you'll do it. What is that number? Out of that two point something universe of inadmissible aliens encountered on our southern border who've come into the country, been released into the country, how many have went through the adjudication process and then been removed? Mr. Chairman, I'd be pleased to provide you with that. Can you guess? Mr. Chairman, it is Can not you give an estimate? Mr. Chairman, I will not why, do so. Why will you not give an estimate to the American people? Because they would like to know, because that sort of frames it. Here's what's come in, here's who you've allowed in, since Joe Biden's been president, and here's the ones who've actually been removed. I would say two things, Mr. Chairman. Number one, I will provide that data to you. We will do so. Well, you're not real good at that because no. you've said that other times here, and you don't give us the data. I mean, we asked information about, about the, uh, the Disinformation Governance Board and all we get is redacted documents, so you're not real good about that. And it's a simple question and, frankly, a question we ask you to be prepared for. We wrote you two letters in the last several weeks to be prepared to answer that kind of question, I think probably that specific question, and you won't give us an answer. Mr. And so th the fact that you won't is bad, and the fact that you don't know is just as bad, 
because it's, it's the one question the country kind of would like to know what's really happening. When you say all these you know, pathways and things and you're just border secure and all the things you say, we kind of like to know what's really happened with the two point something million people who've been released into the country since Joe Biden's been president, how many have went through the adjudication process and been removed? So now simple, I have, simple question. So now I have three points. One, we will provide the data to you. God bless Two, you. We have been, been we've been waiting, but God bless you. I hope you do it this time. Two, we have been cooperating with this committee. We have made countless documents and people available to you. We have provided briefings. Yeah. And, and here's what those, by the way, just so you know, I'll let you finish with your third point. Here's what those documents look like. Here's the one you sent to us on when you formed. It's a policy and responsibilities in the department's information manipulation mission. That sounds scary enough, information manipulation mission, and it's all redacted. And this is, this is the kind of stuff you gave us when we were trying to figure out who was in, responsible for putting together the disinformation governance board that I think my colleague, Mr. Johnson, was asking. And now we're asking a simple question about a number. And the fact that you won't give it to us or don't know it is, I think, a concern for all of us. I would say both sides, because the Democrats probably want to know too. They probably, that, that's, that's something that should be so obvious and you won't communicate to. Make your third point. M Mr. Chairman, we'll provide that information to every, every member. Will of it be like this or will it be a real number? Will it be like that? The third, will it be a real number? Mr. Chairman, the third point I L would Let make. me ask you real quick. Can you get that number to us like tomorrow? Or has it got, you got to go back and is it going to take weeks and months and haggling back and forth on all the letters we do? Congress writes letters to agencies and we haggle back and forth all that, that dance we have to do. Or can you just get us the number? Mr. Chairman, we'll provide that data to you as promptly as possible. My third point would be the most fundamental point of all when we speak of immigration. We are dealing with a fundamentally broken system. We have between 11 and 12 okay. million. I, I, got, I got 50 seconds, so I appreciate that. You, you've said that before, so I got that point. Don't mean to cut you off, but I gotta get this. Now, in your testimony, you said you've arrested 14,000 smugglers. Seems like a big number to me. What happened to those guys? Those individuals, Mr. Chairman, uh, are, if the evidence so supports, prosecuted for smuggling. You've referred them to DOJ, you've, turned, you've arrested them, you've given them over to DOJ? How, what, what's happened to them? Have, have, they been, have they been indicted, taken to trial, found guilty? Are they in prison somewhere? What's, what's the status? L let me that is a huge number, 14,000 smugglers. I mean, God bless you for getting them, but I, I'd like to know what happened to them. Uh, very, very pleased to provide that data to you. Let me provide well, some examples. You just told us a couple, couple minutes ago you work closely with the FBI. We'd like that information too. Uh, that's, that's important. Have you arrested any of them multiple times? Uh, Congressman, I'll provide that information for you. You think that's a possibility? Some of those smugglers you've arrested more than once? Oh, Congressman, when I prosecuted immigration crimes in the 1990s, we saw individuals who had uh, repeated violations uh, of criminal laws of the United States and repeated removals from the United States. You think I've think prosecuted a, My time has expired, but you think a smuggler, title. you catch a, someone smuggling people, smuggling drugs, you wouldn't, that guy would be prosecuted and you'd think you would, again, know that answer too, but Mr. we Chairman. hope you get those answers to us. I yield now uh, to- Unanimous. Uh, the committee will come to order. Um, apologize for typical Congress. 10 minutes later and I wanted to be here. Um, the gentleman from Texas is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mayorkas, members of this committee, please turn your attention to the video screens. All Americans, not only in the states most heavily affected, but in every place in this country are rightly disturbed by the large numbers of illegal aliens entering our country. The jobs they hold might otherwise be held by citizens or legal immigrants. The public service they use impose burdens on our taxpayers. That's why our administration has moved aggressively to secure our borders more by hiring a record number of new border guards, by deporting twice as many criminal aliens as ever before, by cracking down on illegal hiring, by barring welfare benefits to illegal aliens. In the budget I will present to you, we will try to do more to speed the deportation of illegal aliens who are arrested for crimes, to better identify illegal aliens in the workplace as recommended by the commission headed by former Congresswoman Barbara Jordan. We are a nation of immigrants but we are also a nation of laws. It is wrong and ultimately self-defeating for a nation of immigrants to permit the kind of abuse of our immigration laws we have seen in recent years, and we must do more to stop it.
Mr. Secretary, I can understand why you didn't stand with me and my colleagues and clap. You didn't want to clap at that because you and Joe Biden believe just the opposite of what President Clinton just said. You believe in open borders and complete chaos. Did you notice the bipartisan support in the chamber? As the video was played, everybody was clapping in that chamber. If I were in Congress in 1995, I would have also stood. Because I wasn't, I stand here today. Other than President Donald J. Trump, the greatest president in my lifetime, with the most safest and secure border, I believe President Clinton understood just how important border security is to our nation. But boy, oh boy, have times changed. 28 years later, the left has gone off the rails. They've gone completely nuts. They've done just the opposite of what the leader of the Democrat Party, President Clinton, stood for on border security in 1995. This committee's ranking member, he was in Congress in 1995. I assume he stood. I assume he stood. It seemed like the majority, if not all, of the entire chamber, they stood. Matter of fact, Mr. Clinton delivered his speech in the third year of his first term. And he was reelected in 1996. He beat Bob Dole, won by over 8 million votes, won the Electoral College 379 to 159. He had the support of the American people, and I'm going to assume the ranking member also voted for Bill Clinton in 1996. We have two other members, uh, Ms. Jackson and Ms. Lofgren. They were both freshmen at the time. I will assume they stood during that powerful speech as well. And do you know why they supported and voted? They voted for legislation in 1996 strengthening our immigration laws. I applaud them for that. So what's changed, folks? What's changed with the Democrat Party? I'll tell you what's changed. If you wouldn't have heard President Clinton's voice or seen his face, you would have thought Donald Trump delivered that speech. I don't believe that President Clinton was called a racist, a white supremacist who hated immigrants as the left and the dishonest media has painted Donald J. Trump to be. Mr. Mayorkas, there's a reason why you and Joe Biden have allowed 5.5 million people to cross our southern border. This is about votes and elections. I have a report from the Heritage Foundation titled, Tracking Movement of Illegal Aliens from NGOs to Interior of the USA. Why do you think NGOs have moved illegal immigrants to 431 of the 435 congressional districts? The truth is, Hear me, it's because the Democrats' progressive policies are not acceptable to Americans. Heritage obtained a sampling of approximately 30,000 cell phones that were tracked to NGOs along border states. They tracked approximately 22,000 devices at 20 NGO locations in January 2022. The same devices were later traced to 431 separate U.S. congressional districts, and of the 52, with the highest rate of track devices, 71 of them were Republican congressional districts. The report revealed that it's not a coincidence, folks. The flood of illegal immigrants means a continued rise in supply, surplus laborers. That surplus drives down the wages of existing middle class and lower class job holders until they leave the job forces, and then they're forced to go on welfare with the hopes that they will become loyal supporters of the Democrats. That's what this is all about. If this isn't about votes, if this isn't about votes, one party rule, keeping the Democrats in power, I make this suggestion. If you put the American people first, you should refer back to Trump's border policies, but you won't because you hate him. You despise the man. So give Bill Clinton a call, and then he can help you with the border crisis. As President Clinton stated, we are a nation of immigrants, but we are also a nation of laws. You, sir, have betray betrayed constitutional order, neglected your duty, and violated the trust of the American people. And as a nation of laws, I look forward to your impeachment. That I yield back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from California. Mr. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida for five minutes. Two million encounters and releases under your watch. So not including the Title 42 expulsions, not including violent criminals, of those two million plus that you've encountered and released, how many have you told to go home? Um, uh, Congressman, uh, individuals who are released are placed in immigration enforcement proceedings under the law where they can make their claim for relief. If their claim for relief is not satisfied, they are subject to removal from the United right. States. Right, subject to removal sounds very different than actually removed. So I'm not interested in the process. I'm not interested in what people are subject to. <laughs> Two million people encountered and released, not the expulsions under Title 42, not the criminals. 
How many of those people have you deported? So, uh, Congressman, a few points. Number one. Just how many of the people? I just want to know how many. It's just a number. Congressman, uh, we are dealing with a completely broken immigration system. I get system. it. I, no, 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 Mr. Secretary, I'm not going to let you burn my five minutes. Do you know the answer? Do you know the number of people out of that two million that you've removed that aren't criminals? I do know that okay. we have removed more aggravated felons. Right, I'm not asking about them. You, you, I, I've caveated that away. Because here's what I'm, I'm sort of getting and what your non-responsiveness is demonstrating. The Mayorkas doctrine is this. If you show up at the border and get released into the country, if you don't commit a specific aggravated felony, which, by the way, doesn't include a lot of assault and battery, doesn't include a lot of bad domestic violence, but if you're not one of the people who commit those crimes, you get to stay forever. Is, is that a fair characterization of your doctrine? No, that is false. Then tell me how many you're sending home. No, that is false. Okay, well, so, they, but you don't know the number of how many you've sent home. Here's another number. Two point, I'm sorry, 1.2 million people today have been through your entire process. Right? They've been through what you call a removal proceeding is just an amnesty dance. Because after the 1.2 million people get an order from the judge saying that they don't have a basis to be here, you still don't remove them. Like, what's your plan to remove those people? Congressman, that is false. Okay, wh how many of them then? Just Cong give me the number. Congressman, in this country, in this country, there are between 11 and 12 million Right, but I'm asking about a subset that you won't send home. And the reason you're smirking about it and the reason you won't answer my question is because everybody gets the joke. And the sad thing is it's not just us here, it's the cartels who get the joke too. And so now what you've done to execute this Mayorkas doctrine where so long as you don't commit a crime, you get to stay here and burden our hospitals, burden our schools, burden our social services, burden our jails. You've sent the message to the cartels and then you've taken this app and you've digitized illegal immigration and you've scaled it to the moon. Like this app that you've got everybody downloading is like the Disney fast pass into the country, never to be subject to actual removal, just removal proceedings as you call them. That app doesn't do any search of their criminal history in their home country, does it? Congressman, I, I disagree with everything you have well, said. I'm sure, but just to answer the question, does the app that you are out there promoting do any search of people's criminal history in their home country? Congressman. Customs and Border Protection screens and vets individuals whom they encounter. Your early. app, it either has the functionality to test their criminal history in their home country or it doesn't. By the way, if it did, you'd have already told me. It doesn't. And then the other epic failure of this that's empowered the cartels is that in these processing centers you've set up in other countries to just wave them all in at a rapid pace, the, you've had to shut them down in Nuevo Laredo because the cartels were standing outside extorting people. Isn't that right? Congressman, that is false. Oh, really? So why did you shut down that facility in Nuevo Laredo? Congressman, the, the point of safe, orderly, and lawful pathways is to reduce the number of encounters at our southwest border. But, but wait a second. You've, you, you, what, you've just shifted those encounters. Because right now, for the first time in modern history, more people are showing up at the ports of entry than running through some bush in Yuma, Arizona. And the reason they're showing up at the ports of entry is because you've got the turnstile open. Where so long as they've gone and downloaded this app, you just let them in. I got one final question for you, and it's an important one. Is Mexico an ally in this fight against illegal immigration? Uh, yes, it is. So, I mean, it's hilarious and somewhat troubling that you say that, because like I'm looking at the El Chapo trial, where President Nieto took a $100 million bribe from the Sinaloa cartel. Do you think that the subsequent presidents following Nieto weren't offered a bribe by the cartel or didn't take the bribe? Congressman, I, I disagree with everything you have said. Uh, right, right but, well, worked... but you can disagree all you want, but what you won't provide is any number. And when, when you sit there and just kind of ostensibly disagree without any facts, it shows people what the real gig is. The Mexican government is captive to the cartels. They are doing the bidding of the cartels, and based on your response today, so are you. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, let me focus on CISA a moment uh, and something very specific. Jen Easterly, the director of CISA, testifying before an appropriations subcommittee here in the House earlier this year, said, quote, we don't flag anything to social media organizations at all. We are focused on building resilience to foreign influence and disinformation, close quote. Is that true or false? That, that CISA does not flag anything to social media organizations at all. 
I believe that is true, um, Congressman, and um, I will verify that. But I believe that is true. We 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 do. Do you read. know? Do you know? Are you familiar with Brian Scully? Do you know who that is? I do not, Congressman. He was an. Uh, I think the uh, MDM person responsible for MDM, as you call it, and he testified about switchboarding that. Uh, CISA was engaged in switchboarding in which, for example, it was essentially an audit official to identify something on social media that they deemed to be disinformation aimed at their jurisdiction. They could forward that to CISA, and CISA would share that with the appropriate social media companies. Now, that was a quote from his testimony. That sounds like flagging to me, flagging to social media companies, and all of his testimony was, was of similar import. How does that reconcile with what you just said, Ms. Easterly, correctly answered before the Appropriations Subcommittee? Congressman, uh, a few points on switchboarding. Number no, no, one. no, 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 no. Would you, would you, would you, yes. uh, would you reconcile those two statements, please? Yes. I, I don't really have enough time to go off on I, dissertation. Yes, I will. Okay. If you'll allow me. Quickly, thank that you. That practice, my understanding is that that practice was in 2018 and 2020 is no longer employed by CISA, and what it amounted to was serving as an intermediary between election officials and social media companies. We were not making a judgment back then in 2018 when, or 2020. Well, I, I get your point, I get your point, I, and I know you're gonna really elaborate, and I appreciate that, but I, I think the point you just said, and I'd like to inquire further about it, you said it is no longer the practice. When did it stop? I'd be pleased to, um, uh, to provide that information to you, and I will defer to the director uh, easterly, but we will provide that information to you. Uh, you do not know when they stopped doing it? I do not. Um, you have said uh, in your testimony here today several times that we are taking it to the cartels to an unprecedented degree, dismantling those criminal organizations. Those are two things you said. Have Mexican drug cartels become stronger or weaker during your tenure as secretary? Congressman, we are taking it to the cartels to an unprecedented You, you already said that. Degrees. In fact, I just repeated it to you. Have they become stronger or weaker on your watch? Congressman, the cartels have been a challenge for not only this country, but many are countries Are you not able to say world. whether they're stronger or weaker on your watch? We, through our efforts, our efforts have weakened those cartels by the investigations and prosecutions that we have conducted with our international The cartels partners. are weakened under your tenure? When is that we, what your testimony is, sir? When we disrupt a cartel, when we arrest an individual with our partners, we have weakened them. That is what the men and women of the Department much, of Homeland Security are dedicated to doing. How much revenue have the cartels received during your tenure? Congressman, I don't have that data. Do you have any, you have no estimate about that whatsoever? That the you cartels, bear in your mind what revenues cartel, Mexican drug cartels have have received during your tenure as secretary? Congressman, the cartels are very profitable. They were very profitable three years ago, and they were very profitable six years ago. Are they making more or less revenue under your tenure now than under previous administrations? And I will tell you this: that we are unrelenting. In More or, I, I understand your efforts, sir. What I'm talking about are your results. Are they making more or less revenue under your tenure than your predecessors? We have arrested more criminals involved in cartel activity than in the prior. Do you not years. know whether they're making more revenue, or are you simply evading my question, uh, Congressman? I, I believe I answered your question that I do not have that <laughs> data. Are drug deaths this, due to penetrating the southern border of the United States increased or reduced during your 30-month tenure over prior periods? The cartels outside of the United States have also stretched their jurisdiction to other countries around the world. How does your record on achieving operational control compare to other administrations? Worse than any other? Uh, no, Congressman. The approach that we are taking expanding lawful pathways. You've had larger numbers of entries in violation of that of statutory dis of uh, definition, have you not, sir? Congressman, the approach that we are taking of expanding lawful pathways and delivering consequences for those who do not use them 
are proving results. It continues to be a challenge, as the border has been in the absence of legislative action, but we are achieving results. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chairman yields back. Mr. Chairman. Secretary, who must take responsibility for the creation of the Disinformation Governance Board? You as the Secretary of Homeland Security or President Biden? Uh, Congressman, the, um, the Disinformation Governance Board, which has been mischaracterized a so, so who's, is, did President Biden tell you to do it, or did you guys decide to do it? Did you take responsibility for creating that? Uh, Congressman, it is my responsibility, and I will Very share good. with you that— So the last four days, 5,300 people have been encountered in the Tucson sector. Last four days, 5,300. In the last week, over 9,000 in the Tucson sector. That's not my made-up numbers. That's from, from uh, Sector Chief Modlin. Who— must bear responsibility for that. You or President Biden? Congressman, our approach. Is it you or President Biden? Who made the policies that, that let's get there? Did President Biden tell you to, to open up the border or did you? The border is not open, Congressman. Oh, so that's why there's 5,300 in the last four days that illegally tried to enter the country. Congressman. And that doesn't include the Godaways in that sector, which is the number one sector, three to one. And you're saying it's somebody else's fault, it's not open. Well, let's talk about this then. Um, recently retired CBP Chief Raul Ortiz has testified under oath that the U.S. does not have operational control of the border as required. Is it your responsibility or President Biden's responsibility to make sure there is operational control? Congressman. Um, These are not hard questions. It's either your responsibility or President Biden's. Whose is it? Congressman. The men and women of the Department of Homeland Security work tirelessly. So, so look, I'm going to tell you, I get down to the border, I love the CBP agents. You know what they keep saying? We just want to enforce the law. So who's preventing from, from enforcing the law? Is it you or President Biden? It's that, that, it's that simple because your policies are allowing millions of people to get through uh, across this border. So since January 20th, 2021, Millions of illegal aliens have crossed the southern border and have been released by DHS into the interior of the U.S. Did you implement this catch and release program, or was it President Biden? Congressman, individuals uh, who pose a public safety... So, uh, look, look, you, know, you and I have had this song and dance before. You never want to answer the question. You never want to answer the question. Look, there's a whole side over there. They want to feed you pablum so you can say whatever you want. But I think the American people... No, it's either you or President Biden. And I want to know, is President Biden giving the directions on the implementation of your policies? Or are you the one that's creating it? So let's go to some of the stuff that you've written. In September 30th, 2021, you issued guidance that we had a senior DHS official come and tell this committee that your guidance from September 30th, 2021, led to ICE officers not submitting, quote, through their chain of command as many cases as they would have submitted previously, close quote. It was under your name. Did President Biden tell you to write that memo, or is that your policy? Congressman, the, the memo that you refer to is the enforcement priorities memo. Did you, did you is that, that we, yours? Is that your policy then, or is that President Biden's? The priorities that we established in that memo. I'll take it that it must be yours. I, 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 guess, I guess that's all we can take then. Okay, so since we've been sitting here since 10 a.m., that's the number of drug overdoses due to fentanyl in the country. So my question for you is, who's responsible? Is it Joe Biden as president of the United States, or is it you as Secretary of Homeland Security for the open border where fentanyl's coming across and we have American citizens dying? That's since 10 a.m. Eastern time. Congressman, the border is not open. The challenge of fentanyl is one that has been escalating for more than look, five look, look, years. Look, look, let's just, you cited a figure that was 50,000, and since you came in, it's been more than double every year. Who's responsible for that? Is it you and your policies, or is it President Biden? It's a simple thing. You don't want to answer it because you know it's you. You know it's your policies you're driving in. On October 27, 2021, you issued guidance that restricted the ability of ICE officers to arrest aliens in protected areas such as courthouses where they knew aliens to be. You thus made it more difficult and dangerous for ICE officers to go and enforce the law. These are people who had already had, and generally, um, many of them have already had their, their day in court. Did President Biden order you to issue that guidance? 
Congressman, our policies are driven to protect the American people. Who, safeguard. who issued that policy? Was it the president? Did, are you, were you following the president, or did you create the policy? Congressman, that Or will is, you ever give us an answer? That is a policy. Yield back. Disgusting. Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen from... Thanks, sir. The chair yields to Ms. Hageman for five minutes. Thank you. The First Amendment to the United States Constitution rests on the principle that no person or institution, including the government, has a monopoly on the truth, and that viewpoint-based suppression of speech by the government is dangerous and may even spell the death of a constitutional republic. Under the First Amendment, the government has no power to restrict expression because of its message, its ideas, its subject matter, or its content. As the Supreme Court has explained, if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion. Labeling speech, mis speech misinformation does not strip it of its First Amendment protection. That is so even if the speech is untrue, as some false statements are inevitable if there is to be an open and vigorous expression of views in public and private conversation. In refusing to carve out a First Amendment exception for false speech, the framers of our Constitution rec recognized the significant danger in making the government the ultimate arbiters of truth. And it is axiomatic in the words of the Supreme Court that the government may not induce, encourage, or promote private persons to accomplish what it constitutionally for is forbidden to accomplish. Secretary Mayorkas, it was reported in May that the DHS, through the Targeted Violence and Terrorism Prevention Grant Program, is funding groups targeting conservatives and equating them to domestic terrorists. Originally intended to combat foreign terrorist organizations' operations in the U.S., it has become yet another government tool weaponized against citizens to violate First Amendment protection affiliate, uh, protected affiliations and speech. One grant to the University of Dayton for a program titled Provence O hosted a seminar titled Extremism, Rhetoric, and Democratic Precarity. One of the speakers, a known Antifa member, as part of his presentation shared a pyramid of far-right radicalization, which likened the Republican Party to the, the Heritage Foundation, the American Conservative Union, Fox News, Breitbart News, the National Rifle Association, Prager University, Tea Party Patriots, the MAGA movement, and the, the, the pro-police Blue Lives Matter movement, and the Christian Broadcasting Network as the first steps on path leading to Nazism and militant neo-Nazism, among other appalling ideologies and groups. This presenter reportedly also taught tactics on how to pressure the removal of conservatives from platforms, and he's even quoted as saying, a lot of things we are doing are illegal, and a lot of it involves breaking the law. Secretary Mayorkas, does the affiliation with conservative or Christian beliefs make someone a Nazi or a domestic terrorist? Of course not. Okay. Then if that's so, why uh, is your agency targeting Americans uh, who are Christians and conservatives? We are not. Okay. Secretary Mayorkas, when did you become aware that the University of Dayton was implementing your grant funding program to target conservatives and Christians? It is my understanding that it is not. When did you become, so you have, you're not aware of that? No, it is my understanding that it is not. You're unaware of the information that has been produced, and have you ever seen the pyramid that it's up on the screen right now? I, uh, I learned about the individual speaker's comments with which I profoundly disagree. Okay, so when did you find about, out about the speaker's comments? I don't quite uh, recall, Congresswoman. All right, well, you know what? I, I'm, Mr. Mayorkas, I actually really want to thank you as well for coming here today, for your performance. I have watched with absolute fascination as you have danced and dodged and lied. Yes, lied. We know you've lied, you know you've lied, but more importantly, the American public knows that you lied throughout your testimony today. And yet you believe that you and your fellow architects of the censorship industrial complex think that you should be able to determine what is and isn't true and what is and isn't untrue. You are the walking, talking epitome of the very tyrant that our forefathers recognized would gravitate towards government service. 
And it is because of people like you that they drafted the First Amendment. I thank them for their foresight. I thank them for recognizing that you and people like you would do everything in your power to control speech, to control freedom, to take away our rights. And they've written a document that isn't going to allow you to do that. And fortunately, we still have courts and judges who recognize that you don't have the power that you are attempting to take, that you do not have the right to limit our freedom of speech, our freedom of association, our right to communicate. Thank God we have the First Amendment so that we can stop you from doing what you've been doing. With that, I yield back. Your accusations are false. Recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, I have listened both in here and in, in my <clears throat> office today, uh, your testimony uh, before this committee. And I think the frustration that I have as the cleanup crew at the very end of this committee is that you seem to ver answer very eloquently all the questions that the other side of the aisle pose, but when posed with questions, specific questions, about the border on this side of the aisle, you seem to not have, you seem to dance and dodge, as Ms. Hageman talked about, uh, the true answers that you, you talk about, uh, you, you filibuster, if you will, what people really are asking. And these, are, these aren't questions that, that are hatched out of uh, some think tank, these are questions that our citizens have because they see what's going on. You know, what's remarkable to me since day one of this administration, you've terminated construction of the border wall, you restricted the ability of immigration officers to deport aliens who violate U.S. law, you terminated the MPP, the Remain in Mexico policy, despite people on the ground talking about how successful that it was, you abused parole authority to release illegal aliens en masse into the United States, um, and, and creating categorical, categorical parole programs in violation of the ANA's case-by-case -case basis. You refused to follow federal law requiring aliens to be detained during the pendency of their asylum proceedings. You terminated asylum cooperative agreements with Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. You refused to comply with the provisions of the INA that require the detention of asylum seekers. You cut, out, you cut out immigration judges, ICE attorneys, and the process of the asylum system itself. You support sanctuary city, city policies by giving them grants. You implemented until it was enjoined a 100-day moratorium on alien removals. You have misused, as been talked about here, the CBP-1 app that has institutionalized mass parole and release policies in this country. It's been described as a shell game. Pretty pretty fairly stated, that you otherwise shift things around, you, you create definitions within your department that you think that are appropriate, you create law, which isn't your function, uh, and then you come before Congress and you say that everything is fine. Well, we've been to Yuma, Arizona, sir, um, and we've seen the devastation down there. We've talked to people. Seventy sheriffs just last year said that there is no border at all. We simply have no border left in Arizona, New Mexico, Southern California, and Texas. That's the National Sheriff's Association. You've been held to account by courts. Texas v. Biden, DHS's position, quote, position that the crisis at the border is not largely of their own making because of their more lenient detention policies is divorced from reality and belied by the evidence. Florida versus the United States in the nor Northern District of Florida, quote, the Biden administration have effectively turned the southwest border into a meaningless line in the sand and little more than a speed bump for aliens flooding into the country by prioritizing alternatives for detention over actual detention and by releasing more than a million aliens into the country. Uh, real quick, let's play a video. Crisis on the border that just keeps getting worse. These are live pictures of Del Rio, Texas. Uh, town that borders Mexico, where almost 9,000 migrants are currently camping out. Government data showing there were more than 220,000 encounters with migrants along the border last month, the highest number in 22 years. Law enforcement leaders from federal, state, and local agencies announced Tuesday an unprecedented two-month-long fentanyl enforcement surge along the southwest border that resulted in the seizure of more than 4,700 pounds of fentanyl. Fentanyl being pushed through the desert around El Paso is up more than 355 percent compared to last year. For the first time, fentanyl is being smuggled between the ports of entry. There have been more than 200 people on the right, FBI terror crisis on the border that just keeps getting worse. So 
the numbers don't lie. 5.6 million illegal immigration or illegal alien encounters, 1.5 million known gotaways, more than 2.2 million illegal immigrants, aliens into this country, meaning that 3.6 million illegal aliens are in this country since the start of your tenure. That's astronomical. 160 countries, the people on the terror watch list that we know about, 140 just this year, it's at an all-time high. So look, this, 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 doesn't, this doesn't lie. These are the stats, Mr. Secretary. And so you come up here and you blame the former president, and they say that they've gutted the immigration system. You blame Congress for not acting. But you know what? These numbers weren't here for Obama. They weren't here for Trump. But they seem to be here for you. So you like to blame other people for your failures in not doing your job. And quite frankly, the American people want to know, how qualified are you to even carry out your mission? Because everybody else seems to indicate, from local law enforcement to sheriffs to ranchers to farmers to citizens on the border, when I ask them, is the border more secure, they say resoundingly no. And that's on your watch, sir. Without you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last Congress, and again on May 17th, 2023, I introduced articles of impeachment against Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. We have been waiting for regular order for six months, and the Committee of Jurisdiction in Congress has failed to act. My articles of impeachment sit collecting dust with the others while Americans die every single day. The American people support impeachment. Members of Congress support impeachment. And even our esteemed majority whip, Tom Emmer, has endorsed this impeachment resolution. Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas has aided and abetted the complete invasion of our country by deliberately flooding our nation with drugs, terrorists, and illegals from over 160 countries. How many more will he allow to invade our country? Rather than adhering to an oath he took to defend and secure our country and uphold the Constitution, Alejandro Nicolas Mayorkas has engaged in a pattern of conduct that is incompatible with the laws of the United States. Since assuming office, he has allowed approximately 10 million illegal border crossers to invade our country, 1.8 million of whom are known gotaways and have evaded U.S. authorities. Because of his open border policies, he's allowed more than 280 people on terrorist watch list to be caught while attempting to cross the border between ports of entry, as well as approximately 73,000 special interest aliens who are aliens from a nation that promotes terrorist activity, harbors terrorists, or poses a sec security threat to the United States. These numbers do not even account for the approximately 1.8 million known gotaways who are roaming the interior of our country. How many of them are terrorists? Just last fiscal year alone, CBP arrested almost 18,000 individuals with criminal convictions and over 110 MS-13 gang members. How many of the 1.8 million gotaways are gang members? Just last week, Two constituents of mine were killed in a human smuggling pursuit caused by Secretary Mayorkas's open border policies. Jose and Isabel Lerma's family will never get to see them again. His policies allow for approximately 300 Americans to die every single day from fentanyl poisoning. How many more days will this continue? His open border policies have allowed unaccompanied children to be exploited, and now 85,000 of them are completely missing. Tens, and thousands, tens of thousands of illegal children have been forced into slave labor. Thousands of others are being recycled by predatory illegal border crossers who use these children to become fake family units so they can receive expedited release into the interior of our country. Secretary Mayorkas has violated the law by directing DHS to mass parole illegal aliens into the U.S. when federal law specifically prohibits this. And he's been providing bus tickets, plane tickets, and hotel rooms at the expense of the American taxpayers for these illegal aliens. 
He's violated the Secure Fence Act of 2006 by not maintaining operational control of the border as required by law. He has violated the guarantee clause as set forth in Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution, which requires the federal government to protect states against invasion. The guarantee clause clearly dictates that the federal government has a constitutional duty and obligation to protect each of the states from invasion. As Secretary of Department of Homeland Security, he has violated his oath to uphold this constitutional duty by allowing the invasion of approximately 10 million illegal aliens across our borders. He has encouraged asylum fraud, abused the credible fear standard, and exercised mass catch and release policies. Article two of the Constitution requires that the executive branch, which includes the Secretary of Homeland Security, ensure the laws passed by Congress and signed into law by the President are faithfully executed. Alejandro, Alejandro Nicholas Mayorkas, in his inability to enforce the law, has engaged in a pattern of conduct that is incompatible with his duties as a civil officer of the United States. Alejandro Nicholas Mayorkas thus warrants impeachment and trial, removal from office, and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office, trust, and profit under the United States. While some of my colleagues have argued that we need to proceed through regular order to pursue impeachment proceedings, the Committee and Jurisdiction and Congress has failed to act on the overwhelming evidence to impeach Secretary Mayorkas. I urge my colleagues to support my legislation to impeach, to impeach Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. The American people are ready. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back.